and welcome to another Comics Burst from the Full Force podcast, sponsored by Distant Planet Comics and Collectibles, where we take an in-depth look at the newest G.I. Joe comics and related titles of the week. I am Chris McLeod, aka Diagnostic80, and joining me on this burst tonight to tell us tales of the old republic of Ireland is Brian Jedi Shit Hickey. So let's get into our first comic for this week. Oh, and I should say, spoilers ahead. Transformers vs. Visionaries Issue 5, The Final Fate of Cybertron. Leoric and the Drill Team, on a mission to stop the destruction of the planet, reach the core, only to be met by Viralina and her Darkling Lords. Now the two sides are locked in a final battle to determine where the Cybertron sees tomorrow. Everything comes to a head in this thrilling conclusion. Now, when... Okay, so we've been... We've been covering the Transformers vs. Visionaries arc now for all of the comic bursts we've done and something that Paddy and I mentioned on a previous episode before we got you in was that the in 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 such a short period of time there was a lot of information to get across a lot of story to tell and Paddy and I were both a little concerned about the thought that they might be having to cram a lot into this final issue and as we all spoke about issue four I believe we were all talking about that it was a similar kind of situation in that there was still a lot to be unraveled, shall we say. And that kind of leads us into a very strange opening for this comic, in that it's not really done in the same way that it's been done in the last few issues, where you've got this kind of standard issue, point of view, comic story going going forward. To, I think to speed up a lot of the issues that were that needed to be covered, they started doing this weird narration thing. Did you notice that, Brian? Yeah, and you know, and I'm also my because want us to start by saying that loved this comic, thought yeah. it was brilliant. But the narration at the start, I found a little bit perplexing. Right, I couldn't figure out who was actually narrating. And it's given me a bit of backstory or it's, you know, given the reader some backstory that, uh, you know, unless you're really familiar perhaps with the Visionaries canon prior to this you know, this particular arc, you may not really know what they're referring to. No, totally. And I, th- I thought like to kind of go that way with the final issue, I don't know, it felt a little bit cheap. And I, I had said in the past that I thought if you've got like a, a short arc to get your story across in comic form, then it probably doesn't hurt to have a couple of extra sized issues in there just to kind of give you a little bit more breathing space and I always thought like a a final issue of Transformers vs Visionaries would have worked really well with an oversized issue just just to squeeze in some of that story without having to do this weird kind of fast paced narration of like getting to the next bit and getting to the you know like Leoric meeting Cryotech and getting him in I mean once that narration is over we get back into the normal storyline but it just felt a little bit weird There's, there's an element of rush in there and obviously that that's you know there's only so much you can do in such a short space of time they had to have Leoric and Virulina battle to the death or, or to the almost death shall we say we had to have the culmination of what was going on with the the bomb under Cybertron at the time in the depths of Cybertron we had to have like some sort of then we see Ironhide kind of try and take the the bomb that isn't actually destroyed by Arzon when he strikes it it's not destroyed so Ironhide takes that bomb and he tries to you know throw it at its last in the last seconds to try and stop the talisman from overtaking Cybertron he almost dies in that situation as well and then we kind of almost have that whole situation where everything is sorted out in the end because of magic and it just felt a little bit like oh, okay so everyone's fine apart from Cup who didn't come back which is a shame but everyone else seems to be okay and also maybe I think what was was it um I forget the guy's name was it Quick Switch or Quick Switch Quick yeah. Switch um I think it was that but yeah obviously you know he passed away he didn't come back Cub didn't come back but all of the ones that almost died in this story arc are miraculously healed I mean Virulina kind of performs a magic healing spell on Ironhide and that in turn with the mixture of the bomb going off creates this strange I don't know like it upgrades Cybertron and gives the visionaries their small spot of land on that planet. Uh, it, it's all very convenient, isn't it, how it all finishes? There was always going to be a challenge to pull all these different strands of the story together. It would have been nice if we had I had a bit more time. In an ideal world, we'd have a couple of more issues to this arc. Maybe there'd be a bit more of a flashback. 
to kind of flesh out that backstory of how that rift happened between the visionaries. And obviously that's what's being alluded to in that sort of bit of narration at the start as, and you know, we assume it's Leoric that's kind of reflecting back. And because of his failure in the past, it's given him the, I suppose, the courage to go back into uh, New Prismos and try and get the, the Spectral Knights back on board. And he does, he does switch a bunch of them back over to the Spectral Knights as well, which is cool. And there's a lovely, lovely panel, which I'll flash up, where we see a group shot of a number of different characters, a number of different Spectral Knights, including some Series 2 classics like Ramak, you can see in there with his massive horned helmet. Yes. I love that so much. And there's a few others in there as well, which will I'm, I want to get some confirmation on who they are specifically. But um, again, like very, very cool. And again, brings in a lot of those, uh, Kragors in there as well, but brings in a lot of really cool Series 2 elements into it as well. Now, another interesting thing that happens at the end, which is a little bit of a spoiler, but obviously Merklin is imprisoned and he's unable to kind of get out of that situation for whatever reason. He's not as strong as he was. And in his jail cell, Sindar is, is whispering to him to say, you know, don't worry, you still have support here. Um, as if it's going to be Merklin and the Darkling Lords versus the Spectral Knights. That's kind of how it's changed a little bit in this retelling of the Visionaries. In the past, we've had Merklin as the intermediary between the two, and also a, a guy that you didn't really know what his agenda was. So it's a shame now, or well, not a shame, but I suppose it's the natural thing to have Merklin as a bad guy and also, almost like taking the space of what would have been Darkstorm, um, you know, for the Darkling Lords. So. In this new telling, that there, there, there is an, a, a little rebellious group of, of people that are still in that, you know, in the visionaries that want to help Merklin. But he says and states categorically that he's seen the future die. He tells Sindar to bugger off because he's seen the future die. And he's looking on the floor at this kind of little pool of water that he's kind of like, you know, magicking. <laughs> That's not a word. And in that reflection of the water is Unicron. And that's going to lead in, obviously, to the Unicron story, which is going to be the end of the Transformers continuity at IDW, uh, as we as this that that particular continuity, I should say. Mm -hmm. So that that does bring about a few questions. One: Are we going to get a Visionaries spin-off from this? Do you think? And in your opinion? And two: If so, w is it going to have to be separate from what's going on? here well i think they've done a very good job of wrapping things up nicely there may well be a spin-off but they've, they've wrapped it up nice enough that they've kind of set up the continuity that we know is coming anyway with transformers yeah, yeah. and they, and they can put the visionary story to bed if they want to do that yeah i would i really enjoyed this and if they did come out with a kind of a spin-off uh, with of just the visionaries I would definitely go in on this one and um, and would we'll, we'll keep buying it. I'd have to agree. I'd love to see a visionary spin-off here, but at the same time, I'd, I wonder how it would be done. Possibly, like, I mean, there's a lot of rebooting going on anyway. A lot of, you know, story arcs have come to an end. A lot of the, you know, ROM, Micronauts, uh, G.I. Joe, Mask, etc. They've all kind of hit the end of what they were going to be doing. They've all been cancelled or stopped or they've just come to that natural conclusion. So I can see now either a reboot will happen within this combined universe and they'll try something different a few you know in a in a in a little further down the road or they're going to start using these brands individually elsewhere in different continuities possibly but it seems a shame to put all of this kind of work and effort into not just Transformers versus the Visionaries comic, but in all of the different combined universe, for it to kind of peter out a little bit at the end. And I know it's like, you know, I mean, the G.I. Joe thing didn't even get to finish what its story was t it was telling. The Mask comic was cut short and had to, you know, cut its story short, so ended up being a little bit disjointed. Rom and the Micronauts seem to still kind of be going along and doing what they're doing. So it's just, it's just a weird situation that I can't really see... I mean, do you think there'll be a little bit of a gap now? I don't know. It's a, it's a tough one to, to, to call. If, if they, you know, if they're winding down the other kind of, you know, obviously we, we know where this is going to end. Okay. We know where it's going with Unicron and with Transformers mm. and it's going to be a Transformers led to the end of this particular continuity. Yeah. If they were going to shut down the visionaries, now would be the time to do it yeah. rather than to kind of to, to try and drag it out. I'd be disappointed if we didn't get it maybe a little bit more. I think there's more that we could get from these characters and from the creative team yeah. that put this together. But yeah, if, if this continuity is coming to an end, then they can park it where it's at. 
maybe they might make a cameo somewhere down the line you know if uh, presumably you know Unicron and Cybertron are going to come together at some point and then the visionaries could potentially play a role in that yeah yeah but it's, it's a small cameo role rather than kind of a you know a, a main story story arc on its yeah, own yeah yeah well it'll be interesting to see what happens and as for this issue Transformers versus Visionaries 5 let's first off let's give an overall potating for the for the issue the, the whole arc so one to five what would you give the entire story um of the transformers versus visionaries brian Be- before i give my potating on this right i want to call out galadria as being a kick character Big in time. this particular episode so she's been kind of holding back she's been very quiet uh throughout the series but in in this particular episode she kicks she really does. Um, and, and she single-handedly holds off Arzon and uh, the other Darkling Crave Lords. X, yeah, and Sindar, I think. There's even a panel there where she, she she's fighting the three of them all at once um, while Ironhide's trying to make that leap to the talisman with the with the bomb. Overall, for this arc, I mean, I'm going to give it a five potatoes. Awesome. Uh, I've, I've really loved this. The, 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 the writing, I've really loved the artwork is incredible it's throughout. Gorgeous, gorgeous. The reimagined designs for the Visionaries, I'm a huge fan of. Um, from when the first concept art was released way, way back, uh, I thought this looked really exciting. And um, the writing, they've delivered on the story, I, I feel. And while there's a lot of different strands in this particular arc, they wove them all together quite nicely in the end. So uh, five potatoes. Awesome. I'm going to go with four and a half, but only because of a few misgivings with the the final issue. And that's really just down to the fact that they had a lot to kind of tie up. And, you know, the, the use of the kind of narration for a small section of it just seemed a little bit out of place and a little bit lazy. And then it just all it was all very kind of conveniently tied up without too much explanation of what had happened and there is a comment in there i think from wheeljack along the lines of listen i'm not going to pretend to understand how it operates but whatever galadria did to heal you worked like a charm so he's kind of almost saying (laughs) you know we don't know what happened none of us do but you're okay so so you know things like that i just i just felt it probably could have benefited from a six issue run it also could have benefited from a you know an oversized issue maybe like you know at the start and the, at the end or maybe just j- just to give give you that breathing space to actually get that story told in a bit more comfort you know the the leoric virulina battle is also a little bit quick so it's it's very much has to fit inside like one page almost yes. so you know and then obviously like merklin kind of just going well you know you're here i i wanted you to do this this is what i expected and now you're both gonna die and and then he's kind of thwarted at the last second by what's going on underneath cybertron all very good but i'm gonna have to say four and a half potatoes and because of that uh, i it's one of the my, one of my favorite arcs this year actually with, with that for one one thing it was the fact that the visionaries finally got their due and to be kind of almost to be reimagined again it's just nice to see those characters get that reimagining so uh anyway let's move on actually let me say one last thing go for it ba weep grag na weep <laughs> nee nee bong <laughs> And that leads us into G.I. Joe, A Real American Hero, number 251, Special Missions, part one, Stalker. What G.I. Joe, A Real American Hero loves to do is have the longest titles of any comic ever made. They've done it with Six Million Dollar Man, and now they've added another five words to this one. But no, I'm kidding. So this Special Missions, part one of five, G.I. Joe, Cobra, Two opposing forces, two powerful war machines, each made more lethal by the undeniable strength of their individual parts. But who and what are those parts? I just got to stop saying parts. Living legend Larry Hammer shares some of their amazing stories and special missions, one-shot stories featuring a variety of characters and artists to draw them. In this issue, artist Alex Sanchez, Max Ride, First Flight, joins forces with Larry to present G.I. Joe's Ranger Extraordinaire, Stalker. So, this one took me by surprise. When I first saw the drawings, like the initial kind of pencils of this of this inside the interiors, I was like really excited. I thought, oh, you know, Nam flashbacks, but at the same time, like, oh my god, it looks amazing. 
when I started seeing some of the the kind of explanations of what was going on in there, I was expecting just to have like this Nam flashback thing, which is a little bit overdone, a little bit overplayed in this G.I. Joe. You know, we've seen the long range recon patrol to death now. But it was really refreshing that this issue had nothing really to do with that. It was re- simply just a, a mechanism to give Stalker some depth for the rest of the issue, which I thought was really, really cool. And, well, I mean, what were your thoughts of this one, Brian? Again, totally taken by surprise. Like yourself, I was expecting the Nam flashbacks. And that's what I thought I was getting, you know, on that kind of first opening page. And as yeah. we lead into those initial panels... And then I see zombies, and I'm like, "What?" And uh, and you know, then of course, you know, it's a dream. He wakes up, and I mean, it sets the scene. We see Stalker. He is he's a, he's a troubled guy. Yeah. This guy is not happy. He has got he's riddled with self doubt. Um, and you know, rock and roll even refers you know talks him like, "I can hear your screams two rooms away." Yeah, have you been having those nightmares again? So you know, it's a recurring. We realize it's a recurring issue for him. And the psych out name drop as well. I like that. There's the psych using, <laughs> using psych out is the kind of obviously you know it, it makes sense, but he's like the the G.I. Joe psychiatrist in a way, isn't he? And, and uh, that's really interesting. I mean, we've seen Psyche, I'm pretty sure, before in maybe earlier in the, the RAH run yeah. with, with uh, by Hammer, but um, he didn't. He doesn't make an appearance in this one. You're expecting him, you know, to, to, to have, the, to go to Psyche out, but instead we see him with, I think it's, uh, is it Spirit? Spirit, Spirit yeah. Um, sitting on like a water tower or something, and he's just, you know, he's just kind of, he's opening up to him, he's telling him about his problems, and, you know, Spirit doesn't really have a lot of advice to give him, just that he, he warns him that he needs to kind of, you know, he's, he's got to sort out his demons and, and start, start, he even suggests, like, you know, if you want to get that promotion, you know, you want to kind of clean up your act and get yourself sorted. And Stalker says, you know, well, that's not really what I care about. Yeah. What I care about is that I'm going to lose it when my my teammates are really really relying on me yeah yeah and then and then you just get this you know there's no dialogue no kind of no no lettering it's just stalker looking out into the distance and you can see this guy is he's really troubled and then i think it, from there it cuts to the mission yeah the, the new mission that awesome. they're on awesome the the one week later in sierra gordo so we we get that new we get that country you know used again the one that's been in hammers a real american hero stories for god knows how many years now it keeps coming back and coming back yeah it does doesn't it and i've been like really like trawling the issue for kind of homages to things as well like i looked at the the screens in the background in the airport just to see if there were any other things on there but it's all a little bit kind of um you know just gibberish on the boards and there's a kid with like a t-shirt with a, like a jason hockey mask but it could be like the chaos hockey mask that just came out recently oh, for yes. i'm not i mean again i'm just kind of uh the gas bagging a little bit there but it, it might not be anything like that but I, I just really like the thought you know this little kind of interaction with the uh the airport staff of like we've got diplomatic immunity you don't need to see what's in here obviously they know they're like we've been <laughs> we've been told okay on you go please don't please don't make a mess which i love that i love that bit in there <laughs> yeah and the next thing you see they're in the apartment or the hotel room with the sniper rifles set up, and it's the three guys: it's uh, Zap, Stalker, and Shipwreck. And I didn't, I, I completely missed the fact that it was Shipwreck, and I was struggling for ages trying to work out who the other character was. Um, and that's, I mean, it's not a, I'm not kind of having a go at the art. The art's actually really refreshing. It's like a nice, different kind of approach, and I think it looked really, really cool. What, what are your thoughts on that? The, the art's beautiful. I mean, I really think it, it's, it's very different from what we've seen, you know, say from S.L. Gallant's style yeah, that we're yeah. familiar with, uh, and even you know, Neto Diaz's style, who I love the, his work, and I can't wait to see him return to a real American hero. It's it, again, it's just giving us that. It's just refreshing it up a little bit. It's a, it's a little bit kind of grittier, a bit kind of looser uh, in terms of the style of, a, of of the illustration. But it it fits well with the theme here because yeah. this is you know this is you know, the dark recesses of Stalker's soul. That's where we're going here with this, yeah. and how he's going to be tested then later on in this story on this particular mission. So the art, I think, yeah, it works. It works very well for this. Another interesting thing to note was that when some of the interior panels were being shown off by Tom Waltz on Twitter not long ago, we saw one where Stalker was going pinned behind like a what we I thought was a building getting shot at and then firing around the corner with his gun. But in actual fact, he's just standing by the side of the door, coaxing the guy who's outside the door trying to get in to, you know, like obviously to, to he's, he's coaxing him into shooting first. 
shoots through the doors and then that then stalker just shoots the guy dead through the door because he's obviously not standing in front of it like a noob um whilst zap and <laughs> shipwreck are in sniper positions trying to take out the hostage situation which is going on across the street um obviously the the, the they know that gi joe are there the government obviously have betrayed them who have allowed them into the country or so the information's got out so the i think it was like um I'm not sure if it's either the government SWAT or the... I think it's the terrorists, isn't it? The terrorists have sent, like, a team up there. It's, it's definitely a sense that this is these are the terrorists. They, at one point, one of, the, one of the attackers says, you know, you'll never defeat the Trotskyites. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So revealing that they are part of the terrorist group. But this series of pages is some of the best comic book storytelling that I've read in a long time. It's, it's a scene that happens very quickly. But the story is well told. They, they pace it out nicely. And as Stalker immediately suspects that there's trouble outside when he gets that, you know, room service knock on the door. And from there, everything just starts to unfold. And you've got Zap and Shipwreck are totally focused on their mission, which is there. They have the terrorists who have hostages in the building across the way. They have them in their sniper sites. They're totally staying focused and on target. They're waiting to get the order to take them out. And saying, Stalker, are you okay? You're handling things back there. And all hell is breaking loose for Stalker. And it's so well told. It's Not only does he have to take out the guys at the door, but then he gets into more trouble after he's dealt with them uh, and he thinks the coast is all clear. Yeah, you got the disguised room service lady who just like pulls out a machine gun and starts firing at him. And then he has to kind of dodge out of that way and he... And while Zap and Shipwreck are taking out the hostages now, they've been given the green light, uh, Stalker is busy battling with this uh, young female, it would appear she's young, and instead of killing her, he just leaves her to then, and for, he says, like, you know, I've got a moral compass or whatever, so he um, he leaves her to kind of, you know, be in pain or whatever, but then also said, "We, I will, you know, we'll tell them that you're injured and you'll get seen to, but they'll probably want to question you first, so good luck with that. Which I thought was, you know, a nice touch, you know, made him the bigger man, uh, and I really like that. And then obviously when they all, they all pack up their gear, mission accomplished, while Zap and Shipwreck have been cleaning house the other side of the street, they all kind of congregate back and he says, oh, okay, so you, you've packed up already? He said, yeah, we're efficient, boss basically like kind of then justify to stalker how important he was for keeping them in the clear while all that was kicking off so he is then justified and ratified and I'm, i would imagine still troubled though <laughs> I, don't, I actually love that um that piece of dialogue at the end so stalker confesses to the guys you know i was worried about dropping the ball back there and the way zap responds he says are you kidding me the stalker man never drops the ball. Love that. And you can see the look on his face, uh, on Stalker's face. It's almost like, you know what? Everything's kind of good now. It's like he's made peace with his demons. Yeah. Uh, and, and they've all, you know, a shipwreck. It looks like shipwreck has his arm around him as they're all kind of walking out. It's uh, it's just such a great closing panel for the, the story. Now, I was I was just in, in general, I, I think I was taken by surprise by where the story went. I'm glad it, it did really follow in the kind of the historically, you know, known special missions format where you have a number of characters that aren't necessarily ones you see all the time. So it was nice to get, I mean, Shipwreck, you know, you could argue he's in it quite a lot, Stalker's in it quite a lot, but, you know, they throw Zap in there, you throw Spirit in there, you, you, the name drop of Psych Out's in there, Rock and Roll, who, you know, again, is another kind of mainstay. But they're all very much fringe in the in the normal cast. It's usually Scarlet, Duke, Snake Eyes, Storm Shadow, da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. So it's a bit refreshing to see that. I was a little bit worried that, we, you know, in that first one it would just be all stalker all stalker all stalker and it ne ne wasn't necessarily that i'm mean, obviously the story hinges on his well-being and his you know focus and on what, what to do and the, the mission and so on and so forth but i just love the simplicity of it and i just thought it was really nice and it did hark back to some of those old special mission comics from uh, from marvel back in the day what i love about it as well is that they're all in their civvies you don't get to see yeah. any of the the stereotyped kind of costumes. Yeah. Uh, you know, Shipwreck's not wearing a sailor's cap and, and a blue shirt. Yeah. You know, Zap isn't done up in all his kind of gear with the big, you know, fancy helmet and stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's um they're they're you know, they're they're undercover. They're wearing kind of, you know, jeans, shirts, you know, suit jacket, 
Um, Stalker doesn't have his normal beret. I mean, in the flashback scene at the start, he does. But, you know, once he's on this mission, he's just wearing a, you know, kind of a, a blue gray suit with a, a T-shirt underneath. Very casual looking. So putting the characters in a, you know, in a different kind of visual look. They still hold up as characters, yeah. But it puts a whole different spin on the story, and it makes it a lot more refreshing from kind of what we're used to seeing on, on their typical combat missions. I'm really now. I'm kind of really excited to see what they do with the Baroness next, and Duke, and Destro, and you know, I'm really excited to see what they and Scarlet. I'm excited to see what happens with those, and I'm I'm really hoping they bring a few more fringe characters into play in and around that character as well. It, that might be a good way to go. I do moan about the overuse of certain characters but if you can have one one or two mainstays and then litter it with lots of different other characters then i'm happy with that like i could i could honestly deal with that as long as other characters get that spotlight get get to show off what they're really capable of because there's some really good stuff in there from zap there's some really you know cool stuff from from spirit and how he talks to him and and, and and i just really liked that whole comic i thought it was great and this for me i'm gonna go ahead and just say that is a five potato comic for me i'm gonna weigh in here and totally agree this is five potatoes and if anyone's out there on the fence about the real american hero uh, series get off the fence <laughs> start buying these comics hammer is on fire he's writing some of the best stuff he's ever written and this is certainly, you know, this this particular mission, that's up there with the best and, and really shows that he's, he, you know, this guy still, he still has what it takes to deliver great storytelling. Fantastic. Okay, um, on to the last segment for today. And that's IDW hires John Barber and Anita Fraser. We reported a few weeks ago about Chris Ryle leaving IDW and a number of other big changes to the company's personnel. So it isn't a surprise that we got the news of two significant new hires this past week. John Barber has been named Editor-in-Chief and Anita Fraser was made Senior Vice President of Sales and Marketing. There were legitimate concerns when Ryle left as to who would take his place and it would appear that IDW have chosen wisely but that I'm sure will be better determined over time. Barber, famous for his work on Transformers and Doctor Strange in the past, is sure to be a solid replacement for the recently departed Ryle. What do you think about this announcement, Brian? Is this a positive move on IDW's part? I think you always have to look at things in a positive light, or at least I, I try to. So when one door closes, you know, we have a, a great talent in Chris Royal. He moves on. Uh, you have to find the silver lining somewhere. Um, you know, IDW aren't going to close up shop and, and go away. An opening now is in the organisation, and they've filled it with someone who has a great repertoire behind him. You know, an amazing CV in the comics industry. Yeah. And and, you know, and with Barbara coming to the team, it's a real opportunity to maybe shake things up, you know, yeah. bring the d- back a little bit into <laughs> some of the storytelling. And, and not to take anything away from, from Chris Ryle because he has an amazing track record. But, you know, John Barber has that, you know, that background with Marvel. And to see what he can do in this universe, I mean, it's, re- it, it, you know, it, it, it's got to come with some amazing opportunities. So I'll be very excited to see where this is going to go it must be quite exciting for him I, I'm, I'm going to see if we can wrangle some sort of interview i know it's probably a bit crazy but i want to i would like to talk to him and, and see what he thinks about you know the, the fact coming into the to the company at a time when a lot of things are being tied up so it's going to be a lot of fresh starts for a lot of different brands under the idw umbrella i'd be interested to see like how he feels about that you know obviously we 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 don't know we can't speculate on that at all but it must be quite interesting from you know from from that point of view i would love to go into a job like that knowing that there's a lot of fresh starts happening as opposed to having to i don't know like continue on something that's successful or you know that's always i think that's always quite difficult i mean sometimes you can get lucky and you ju- you kind of come into something that's successful and it's already you know it, it's it's already doing what it's doing and you just have to guide it but you know in this case he's got an opportunity i suppose to kind of like yeah to to try some really different things um with each of those brands so yeah that would be quite cool you you make a good point there because i mean when i did read that uh, article that, that announced that Barbara joined IDW. Yeah. It, he's not the only person coming into the mix. And there's, in fact, there's a lot of changes and shifts yeah. happening in IDW right now. And when you get that kind of energy happening, it really allows itself for, for some new great ideas 
you know, to come to the fore. And perhaps with the you know the Transformers continuity and the combined the Hasbro combined universe continuity all coming to an end, maybe you know it could be reimagined you know in, in some amazing new way, which uh, could be fantastic. Totally. Um. So yeah, I mean, good luck to John and Anita Frazier. And there's again, I'm, I really, I there's no way of knowing exactly the ins and outs of the senior vice president of sales and marketing. But again, like good luck to both of those two new hires, uh, IDW, and also good luck to Chris Ryle, who has moved to Skybound Entertainment now. So he's with, um, you know, some really big names there, Kirkman, obviously, for you know the kind of Walking Dead scenario and all that stuff. So I mean, there's, uh, there's a real, I mean, that's a that's a big fish right now, and I think that, uh, yeah, uh, good luck to Chris, good luck to John, and good luck to Anita, good luck to IDW, and um, yeah, and that's pretty much it for this installment of the Fall Force Comics Burst. Thank you to my awesome co-host, Brian Hickey. (laughs) See you next time, and as always, Fall Force. Make sure you get involved with the discussion by liking, sharing and commenting on these videos and as always you can keep up with the show after listening by following on Twitter at The Full Force, liking the Facebook page facebook.com slash The Full Force and if you would like to contact the show you can message us on either of those platforms with feedback, questions or just a troll. Look out for more of these comic bursts on Podbean, iTunes, Stitcher, our Facebook page, Twitter feed and YouTube channel from now on. Full Force. And a big shout out to our sponsors, Distant Planet Comics and Collectibles, located at 601 Business Loop 70 West Suite 263, located in the Parkade Centre, Columbia, Missouri. You can visit their website at distantplanetcomics.com and on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash distantplanetcomics.